everything inside me. Most patriots agree that we're fighting something called globalism. But what is it? First and foremost, it is a British invention. Modern globalism was born in Victorian England and later promoted by Britain's Fabian socialists. It is now the dominant belief system of today's world. George Orwell called it Ingsoc. In his novel, 1984, Orwell foretold a future in which the British Empire merges with the United States to form Asenia, a superstate driven by an evil ideology called Ingsoc, an abbreviation for English socialism. Orwell's dystopia was based on his knowledge of actual globalist plans. As British power expanded in the 19th century, global dominion seemed inevitable. Imperial administrators laid plans for a world united under British rule. The key to making it work was to join forces with the United States, just as Orwell described in his novel. Many Anglophiles in the US were more than eager to go along with this plan. We are a part, and a great part, of the Greater Britain which seems so plainly destined to dominate this world, enthused the New York Times in 1897, during the festivities for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. In 1842, Alfred Tennyson, soon to become Queen Victoria's official poet laureate, wrote the poem, Loxley Hall. It envisioned a golden age of peace, under universal law, a parliament of man and a federation of the world. Tennyson's words foreshadowed the League of Nations and the UN. But Tennyson did not invent these concepts. He merely celebrated plans already underway among British elites. Generations of British globalists have cherished Tennyson's poem as if it were holier it. Winston Churchill praised it in 1931 as the most wonderful of all modern prophecies. He called the League of Nations a fulfillment of Tennyson's vision. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. Another British leader influenced by Tennyson's poem was, philosopher John Ruskin. In his first lecture at Oxford in 1870, Ruskin electrified students by declaring, it was Britain's destiny to reign or die, to rule the world, or be ruled by others. With these words, Ruskin gave birth to a doctrine that would soon come to be known as, liberal imperialism, the notion that liberal countries should conquer barbarous ones in order to spread liberal values. A better name would be, socialist imperialism, as most of the people who promoted this concept were actually socialists. Ruskin called himself a communist before Marx had finished writing Da's Capital. In Ruskin's view, the British Empire was the perfect vehicle for spreading socialism. Ruskin's socialism was strangely mixed with elitism. He extolled the superiority of the northern races, by which he meant the Normans, Celts, and Anglo-Saxons, who built England. He saw the aristocracy, not the common people, as the embodiment of British virtue. Ruskin was also an occultist and, according to some biographers, a pedophile. In these respects, his eccentricities resembled those still fashionable in certain globalist circles today. Ruskin's teachings inspired a generation of British statesmen. One of the most devoted Ruskinites was, Cecil Rhodes, 1853-1902. As an undergraduate, Rhodes heard Ruskin's inaugural lecture and wrote out a copy of it, which he kept for the rest of his life. As a statesman, Rhodes aggressively promoted British expansion. The more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race, he said. In his will, Rhodes left a fortune to promote British rule throughout the world federation of all English-speaking countries, and the ultimate recovery of the United States of America as an integral part of the British Empire. 
all of this was supposed to lead to the foundation of so great a power as to hereafter render wars impossible and promote the best interests of humanity, Rhodes concluded in his will. Thus, world peace would be attained through British hegemony. By the 1890s, most British leaders agreed with Rhodes. Following Rhodes' death in 1902, Alfred Milner took over his movement, setting up secretive round table groups to propagandize for a worldwide federation of English-speaking countries. In each target country, including the US, the round tablers recruited local leaders to act as Judas goats. A Judas goat is an animal trained to lead others to the slaughter. In fact, the round table was leading people to a literal slaughter. War with Germany was expected. The round table sought commitments from each English-speaking colony to send troops when the time came. Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa agreed. World War I pushed the world toward globalism, giving rise to the League of Nations. This was by design. British design. Generations of schoolchildren have learned that Woodrow Wilson was the father of globalism. But Wilson's ideals were spoon-fed to him by British agents. On August 14, 1914, only 10 days after England declared war, novelist H.G. Wells wrote an article headlined, The War That Will End War. This is now a war for peace, he declared. It aims at a settlement that shall stop this sort of thing forever. Wells released a book version of The War That Will End War in October 1914. He wrote, if liberals throughout the world will insist upon a world conference at the end of this conflict, they may set up a peace league that will control the world. Wells did not invent the idea of a peace league. He was simply promoting official British policy. Wells was a secret operative for Britain's war propaganda bureau, known as Wellington House. British leaders understood that their peace league would never work without US support. For that reason, British intelligence made special efforts to penetrate the Wilson White House, which proved surprisingly easy. Wilson's closest advisor was Colonel Edward House, a Texan with strong family ties to England. During the Civil War, House's British-born father made a fortune as a blockade runner, trading cotton for British munitions to arm rebel troops. Young Edward House and his brothers attended English boarding schools. While advising President Wilson, Colonel House worked closely with British spies, especially Sir William Wiseman, the US station chief for Britain's Secret Intelligence Service, or SIS. House, Wiseman, and Wilson became intimate friends, even vacationing together. The idea for a League of Nations came from Sir Edward Grey, Britain's foreign secretary. In a letter of September 22, 1915, Gray asked Colonel House if the president could be persuaded to propose a League of Nations, as the idea would be better received coming from a U.S. president. When Wilson attended the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Wiseman and House were close at hand, guiding his every move, along with a bevy of other British and U.S. officials, all committed to the globalist agenda, and many tied directly to the round table. Former SIS officer, John Bruce Lockhart, later called Wiseman the most successful agent of influence the British ever had. British historian H.A.P. Taylor wrote that Wiseman and House made the special relationship a reality. Many historians hold that the US-UK special relationship began only after World War II, with the creation of NATO and the UN. However, Taylor correctly notes that the seeds of the special relationship were planted earlier, at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. In Paris, US and UK officials secretly agreed to coordinate policy, so that both countries would act as one. Two think tanks were created to facilitate this, Chatham House, UK, and the Council on Foreign Relations, US. To the great distress of British globalists, the US Senate refused to join the League of Nations. It took another world war, and the persuasive talents of Winston Churchill, 
to finally draw the US into global government via NATO and the UN. Churchill's vision of global government was oddly similar to that of Cecil Rhodes and the Round Table. Churchill called for a world organization backed by a special relationship between English-speaking countries. On February 16, 1944, Churchill warned that, unless Britain and the United States are joined in a special relationship within the ambit of a world organization, another destructive war will come to pass. Accordingly, the UN was founded on October 24, 1945. However, the UN was not enough. Cecil Rhodes and the Round Table had always maintained that the true power behind any global government must be a union of English-speaking peoples. Churchill repeated this plan in his Iron Curtain speech of March 5, 1946. Churchill warned that the UN had no international armed force or atomic bombs. The US must therefore join with Britain and other English-speaking countries in a military alliance, Churchill argued. No other force could stop the Soviets. Churchill stated that world organization was useless without the fraternal association of the English-speaking peoples. This means a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States. Churchill's words led to the 1949 NATO Treaty and the Five Eyes Agreement, pooling intelligence efforts by the US, UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Step by step, Churchill drew us ever closer to the global superstate Orwell called Asenia. A self-described Tory anarchist, Orwell hated Soviet communism. If he wished, he could have written 1984 as a sort of British Red Dawn, with England groaning under Soviet occupation. But that was not Orwell's message. Orwell warned of a danger closer to home. He warned of British globalists and their plan for a union of English-speaking countries driven by Ingsoc ideology. In many respects, the world we inhabit today is the world Orwell foresaw. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This everything inside me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.